Good morning to So I think maybe we can move this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm Navakant Bhatt, uh, chairperson of uh, Center for Nanoscience and Engineering at uh, the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And uh, you know, this is a very unique session that uh, we have begun this year uh, to have interaction with prospective students. Uh, the intent is to make sure that you know your whole journey is very enjoyable, right? From uh, you know the day you decide that you want to appear for an interview here and then you know, till you will perhaps come here enter right as a phd student as a research student so uh, we have this interaction planned over two days uh, today and tomorrow the idea is that uh, colleagues uh, in our center will uh, come on live and interact with you will also give an opportunity for you to you know post your questions directly to them if you have some um, so let's begin then um, you know i will uh, give a very brief introduction about the center how do you slide So this center is, you know, one of its kind centers in the country and perhaps uh, among the such centers anywhere in the world. Um, you know, our intent is really to transform the Indian nanotech landscape uh, in the coming years. Uh, so this center itself started, uh, you know, with an idea of creating a nanofabrication center way back in 2000. Principal scientific advisor to the government of India along with Ministry of Communication and IT, launched National Nanoelectronics Initiative in 2002. Subsequently led to uh, a joint project between IAC Bangalore and IIT Bombay, Center of Excellence in Nanoelectronics, which started in 2005. But after that, you know, we were able to uh, convince our institute administration to create a new department in the institute. Department in this uh, institute, we have our own PhD program, we have our own master's program, MTech program, and uh, we actually moved into this center in the year 2010. And uh, in 2015, we had an honor of, uh, you know, the prime minister uh, visiting our center and formally dedicating our center to the services of the nation. So this sort of tells you that, you know, um, we started from nowhere in September 2006, and uh, today we have uh, one of the best uh, nano centers in the world, right? Uh, you will see in the center when you come for your interview you will be able to visit uh, some of the laboratories here we have national nanofabrication facility which enables you to you know make nanoscale devices you know i know the students uh, who are uh, listening right now are from varied background uh, maybe electronics mechanical materials science background perhaps physics, chemistry, and various other disciplines Center caters to everybody, right? So if you want to create a, a extremely small device and study 
either the phenomenon that happened at the nanoscale, just the science at the nanoscale, or uh, harness the phenomenon and build some applications thereof that year. Right? And once you create your device, you need to test the device. Uh, there is a micro and nano characterization facility. The device, you need to package the device. We have MEMS and IC packaging facility. Then you can build a system around it for which we facility and there are large number of uh, thematic labs like there's a lab for NEMS, there's a lab for biosensors, there's a lab for biophotonics, right? And uh, you know, whole range of uh, that you can imagine. Yes, sir, but actually it is supposed to be taking this one. Slides were not shared. No, yeah. shared oh, okay. Oh, it was not shared. Okay. So, have you seen the other slides or not? Uh, they are seen, not seen because they are seen. Yeah, you can, you can this is not seen. This is not seen. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, right now we are 16 faculty members in our center very large number of PhD students and we hope that you will be part of this uh, family 150 PhD students at this center right now we started an MTech program in nanoscience and engineering a couple of years ago and uh, we have uh, at present about 20 MTech students we also have large number of uh, technical staff postdoctoral fellows project staff uh, you know, uh, run the center, all the something that we do from the center, and, and we are very proud about that is an outreach program that uh, you know, you need to create an ecosystem, uh, which is a very strong ecosystem around us across the country. And hence, we launched this Indian Nano Users Program. Under this program, we train uh, researchers and faculty from across the country. We bring them here, give them training in nanotechnology, provide hands-on. And some of them actually come here and spend extended period of time and conduct their research. Two years, we have trained more than 4,000 people from across India. Right? This is this is just amazing. Right? Um, large number of them are PhD scholars from uh, other institutes and also faculty members from other institutes. Right? Going forward, you know, we want to be able to ensure that as a country. We produce something like 1,000 PhDs per year through a, you know, a network program, right? Where an IAC and this center will play a very, very major transformative role. So what we do in this center is uh, all, all aspects, starting from the 
fundamental science, discovery of new ideas, new phenomena, then taking it through the logical next steps all the way to building systems which could be deployed for use in society. Right? So, you know, depending on your interest, you can fit in in any of these boxes or perhaps you can be able to work across all these domains when you are here. Illustrate, uh, uh, you know, this point. I'm showing you this slide which, has, which were created from this center in a very short span of four, right? Each startup is on a very specific area and these startups represent very diverse areas. Right? I2N Technologies is in uh, instrumented nanoscale uh, measurement. Patshod Healthcare is uh, healthcare application, molecular or you know, uh, point of care diagnostics. Or of uh, you know, 3D printer and related uh, equipment building. GT Silicon is uh, electronic systems for sensor interface, right? So it sort of gives you an idea of the breadth that we cover. To sort of continue on this uh, theme, some of the products that came out from our center, MEMS pressure sensor has been used uh, in a wide variety of aerospace applications. Aeronautical Development Agency, HAL for the helicopters, right. So there is a big demand uh, to use this uh, pressure sensor now. As I already mentioned, the healthcare device, one of its eight different tests on device. CVD reactor, which enables, you know, nanoscale fabrication or processing, which is extremely important if you want to build a nanoscale device. So this CVD reactor was designed, engineered and built in our center and is now a commercial product. We have a very strong connect with the industry. We run uh, an industry the affiliate membership program wherein uh, you know currently the the companies listed in this slide are part of our industry affiliate membership program especially some of you who may want to work in industry after your phd you know this gives a platform you know to start interacting with industry right from your days here as a phd scholar Right. So that's a big advantage. Some of the new initiatives that uh, we have launched uh, right now. Gallium nitride power electronics is, uh, you know, an emerging, uh, gallium nitride is an emerging material. Is that, you know, we have lost the silicon manufacturing, right? Uh, we are way far behind compared to the rest of the world. It is a On the other hand, gallium nitride is an emerging area and we are really working with the government right now to establish a commercial foundry in gallium nitride for power electronics and RF applications. Electronics beyond silicon is another big thrust, building electronics based on oxide materials, which are semiconductors, or chalconate genides, which are semiconductors. Perhaps down the line, these are the materials which will, uh, you know, be very essential to build our electronics. Photonics, nanophotonics, uh, you know, is another very big area. More about that in the next uh, session or perhaps later today. 3D system scaling is essentially to, you know, build a chip which is 
continuous components on it. It will have CMOS, which is memory and logic. It will also have a biosensor, gas sensor, perhaps pressure sensor, accelerometer, you know, actuators as well. This kind of heterogeneous integration does not exist today. The kind of uh, systems that we want to build going forward. Healthcare nanobiotechnology is one other thrust area here. Application for uh, you know biosensors, drug delivery, DNA sequencing, next generation DNA sequencing. These are some uh, very important applications that we are focusing on. Energy, in particular, photovoltaics and energy harvesting is also another thrust area and finally application of nanotechnology for agriculture food processing environment pollution monitoring this is also going to be a, a, a extremely challenging area in the coming years right so we hope that some of you come here and join as a part of our journey to pursue your PhD will be able to pursue your research in one of these areas right when you are here right and you will hear a little more about each of these areas through my colleagues thank you and uh, you know we appreciate your time uh, tuning in and uh, you know listening to us and you know if you have any questions I don't know whether we have time for questions, but uh, perhaps uh, you know we will go on with the next presentation, and uh, you can keep posting your questions as uh, as we go on. Okay, thank you. No, 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 it can continue. It should continue. Uh, we'll uh, put the next uh, slide. No? Stop stop broadcaster the camera
Hmm? You want to do the entire screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't you do the, this one? Yeah, that's that's not, uh, making the next step point. That's creating issue. Right. Yes. Yes, sir. Although they have a number of students, but packing the support students from projects. Okay. 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 But we'll have to answer all of them. Otherwise, no, no. Yeah, put those questions there. This is what I said. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Ambarish Ghosh. I'm a faculty member. So the research areas that I work on, uh, I'm going to explain the first two to you in next uh, few minutes. So the first one is related to swimming at the nano scale. So we developed nano swimmers and our idea is to take them all the way from fundamental applications. The second one uh, is, is related to matter interaction in um, small metal nanoparticles and how plasmonics um, uh, can be used in conjunction with two dimensional materials like graphene, molybdenum sulfide, etc. Third one is related with quantum fluids. I'm not going to talk to uh, talk about this out here, but if you're around during the interviews, uh, I would be happy to tell you more about what we do uh, in that area. So the PhD topics uh, that are being offered this year uh, from our group, the first one is related with changing um, the swimmers in vivo, which means uh, inside the body and how we are bringing in 2D materials and nano swimmers together is yes. the second one is related with uh, more of a type of a project where we would like to um, generate single photon generation detection and manipulation and how it can be uh, taken towards futuristic quantum technologies so in next uh, one or two slides, I think all of you know about, know who this person is. This is Richard Feynman. And there is a very famous uh, movie um, that sort of is the motivation of this uh, research project. It's related, it's called Fantastic Voyage, where a team of doctors were miniaturized and driven inside human body. So our research question is, well, um, can we move very small things in fluids for example, in biological fluids, for example, in human blood, can we move them with good control? Can we do them? Lots of different functions. So you can imagine driving them uh, through an organ, taking it to a cancerous tumor and delivering some drugs. And all the way you are doing it by looking, it, looking at it from outside. So that really is the research question. So the grand goal of this research problem is to realize Feynman's dream of the so-called surgical nanorobots. 
the specific research problem that we want to uh, work on is how to be able to see them. Now, seeing them and moving them um, is fairly easy. Uh, I think you can probably, um, is this movie playing, uh, Peter? Well, but it's not playing here. It's playing, but it's not showing here. The YouTube? It is. Okay. So, as you can see, these things, um, they're of the order of a micron or too long. And again, the details are available in all these uh, papers that are available in, my, in our website. Um, in my group website, all these papers will be available. The key idea is to uh, is we use small magnetic fields to drive them in different trajectories. The top two movies are um, actually moving them in deionized water, which is a very model system, and the lower one is actually about um, is uh, actually driven in human blood. So those little balls or uh, objects that you see are uh, red blood cells, white blood cells. Now. Of course, it's very easy to do these things, or at least we have perfected the technologies now to do them, do these experiments in a microscope. Under a microscope, we just take a little bit of a fluid and we can move them around. But the next stage, we really want to take these things inside human body, if not directly inside you, take them in, uh, at least in the body of inside a mouse. So how do we image such small things? You can see this little image left you have this uh, little helix screw like structure which is of the order of a micron or or so and we want to move them and we want to move them inside let's say some organ maybe inside kidney inside liver and we want to image them from outside and this is amazingly difficult there is absolutely no technology that can do that x-rays mri will not work at this scale so not only does this require a new science and then we also need to translate this new science into new technologies. Um, there is no technique currently available. There is a little bit of a preliminary initial result that we have developed in our lab. And it's, if we work on it, we may be able to solve this tremendously impactful problem. So in, to, to, to summarize without going into the details, this research problem requires collaborative, multidisciplinary, highly, extremely high impact research, and it will require a variety of different techniques to come in. So let's say you are from a physics or maybe an electrical or mechanical engineering background, you would be working with a team of doctors, maybe with other students who are biologists. If you are somebody from a chemical engineering background, uh, you would probably be learning how to make uh, magnetic field coils and dealing with uh, how you handle biological cells. So there is a lot of scope of learning new disciplines, new type of uh, techniques in your PhD research. So that was the research problem one. The second research problem is just one slide. So as you see, as uh, communications and information technologies are developing, we believe that the next generation in this uh, line of technologies will entirely rely on quantum mechanics. So how do we prepare our, ourselves for that? So what we propose, um, we are trying to develop a single platform which can generate, manipulate and detect single photons. So on demand generation of a photon, we can manipulate its state, its quantum state, and then finally be able to detect it all in one single platform. Uh, again, we have some initial results along these lines and our take on integration of graphene, which is a two-dimensional material with plasmonics, which is the study of uh, light matter interaction in metal particles with single quantum emitters, which in this case with uh, two-dimensional uh, materials, small quantities of two-dimensional materials. So these are the two research problems uh, that we are working on, and I look forward to uh, answering your questions on these. Thank you.
Question, what is the name? Do I get started? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Supradeepa. I'm a faculty member here at Sense. And uh, over the next five minutes, I'll be giving you more details on what we do in our lab. Um, so, one of the key areas that we work in uh, is in high power lasers. So whenever you think of high power lasers, you might be, you know, thinking of Star Wars and lightsabers and so on. Uh, but as you well, very well know, uh, there is a lot more <laughs> that we can do with high power lasers. And some examples I have in my slide applications such as laser cutting, laser drilling. Uh, and then there is a lot of defense applications, of course. Over the last uh, years, people are starting to make laser weapons also use it in a version of radar is known as lidar which gives you much greater resolution and then of course if you have to ask which is the biggest application of lasers to date it's just internet so the very reason uh, uh, we can communicate extensively over the internet the way we are right now is because there are lasers running the entire communication system behind us we do in our group is we we do everything so we design build and productize very high power lasers for all of these applications that i just mentioned and the goal being to develop indigenous technology and uh, also expertise in in these laser systems so for example i have two pictures here uh, it's completely home built of course it's outside a packet so it looks uh, quite different from what you would expect a, a high power laser to look like but then that's a 20 watt laser and a 200 watt laser uh, uh, that we have completely built in house we are at the end a research group so all the lasers that, that we build or any research that happens in our group uh, is cutting edge uh, which satisfies one of two things basically either it is the first demonstration of a new idea which has resulted in a new technology, or we are achieving performances that was never seen before. Okay, I hope uh, that point is clear. And uh, let me just see if I can play a video of showing one of these lasers in action. Okay, so this is a, a hundred watt laser that we have built in our lab. I apologize if the if the video doesn't uh, play very well. Uh, but to give you an idea, um, you might think, oh, how big is 100 watts? So to give you an idea, it generates as much power that our sun generates in a square feet, which is one-tenth the size of your hair. So if you do the mathematics, I hope, you know, plus or minus one zero, you know, to that level, it is one lakh crore times brighter than the sun and so because of those kind of light intensity use these easily cut that you can think of right? um, so what are we looking at primarily so whenever you think of lasers i mean uh, just like i mentioned about the death stars and lightsabers and even in in movies differently so if you go to google and ask the question how do each laser looks like then you will see all these different pictures that I've put and every laser is different so one of our key areas of research right now in fact uh, we derive from I'm sure you recognize uh, probably because I've also put in the name there uh, CB Raman who was a former professor and director at IIC and it's, it feels really great to to use the ideas that he proposed in the 1930s to build very advanced lasers 
suitable for the next millennium, in fact. So what we do is using uh, concepts of Raman scattering, we are able to build very practical technology sources, very high power lasers in any wavelength and with any emission profile. So think of it this way. The goal, which we are hopefully going to achieve soon, is to be place studies with a single box if I can uh, you know, say it that way which can emit any color uh, any power and any profile so it's sort of an ubiquitous laser technology so that's sort of our ambitious goal for which we'll need all the support teachers students staff everyone the other area that I work on is in optical communications which as I mentioned uh, the goal is now I'm speaking to hundreds of you over YouTube, uh, but let's say we want to speak to the entire world. So how do we support this scaling of bandwidth continuously? And it has been identified that the conventional internet technology cannot scale very well because uh, right now one transceiver system on a line card might, might be the size of a rack, but if you want to make it 10 times bigger, occupying the size of a room and so it has been identified that the way forward is to put the entire optical communications on a chip uh, this is work that i do very closely with professor shankar who will be speaking soon so we have put in a lot of optical functionalities that conventionally would have required large footprint devices into very compact integrated platforms so i have some examples we have made very agile light sources on chip and also do nonlinear optics, which you would always imagine would need very high power lasers and large optical tables. But now we are able to do all that on, uh, on a chip, which is, you know, uh, microns by microns. Okay. So to summarize, uh, we have quite a, a varied group here. So in fact, uh, if I can use the picture I have there, we have a high power uh, group and a low power group and the, the thing is it's the distinction uh, is is artificial because the, the physics and the engineering is identical and uh, so we have a group of staff and uh, there is actually quite a lot of exciting problems that have come up in all these uh, areas of interest and we'd be very happy to to have students uh, join us in any of these areas in all of which we we do have very exciting problems to work on right so hope uh, that gives you a good feeling uh, for what we do uh, we also have a website please uh, look through the sense website in detail or uh, you come in for the interview because lots of these questions could be answered uh, just by that small thing that you can do okay so feel free to contact us or any of the students and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So time of interview, I said, again, 15 20 is one. 1520 is one. Yeah. All right. Uh, so it's on, right? Yes. All right. Uh, so I'm uh, Shankar Kumar Sandaraja. Uh, so we are continuing the, the photonics uh, theme here uh, of integrated uh, photonic circuits. So the research spread uh, in, uh, in my group 
spans from use of photonic uh, application of photonic circuits uh, in sensing, for instance, life sciences could be for communication and it could be for uh, sensing the environment. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, different uh, wavelength uh, region, because it uh, happens, uh, there are certain wavelength regions that are interesting for a particular application. So if you're looking at life sciences, uh, a lot of the, the integration is done in the visible range, right? So that's why you have, have microscope is developed uh, in the visible range. And then uh, telecommunication uh, mostly happens in the near infrared, so uh, range. And then if you go beyond uh, near IR, kind of infrared uh, region, where these gas molecules are Know, highly active so they absorb uh, certain wavelengths pretty uh, molecular fingerprint what we call so we can exploit those absor uh, absorption and then build photonic circuits so uh, in the group we develop material um, so we do uh, develop new material platforms uh, develop devices for uh, those application and then connect those devices and make circuitry out of it so that means you are building some meaningful application platform and then at the end we also develop uh, you know system integration as well around the circuits that we develop so basically going through the whole food chain of developing a device or material platform uh, till uh, demonstrating the application uh, in a more you know a prototype level as well so photonic integration uh, just want to give you an idea what do we mean by photonic integrated circuits right? so electronic integration we all know single trans uh, which had one primary functionality to to change the resistance uh, in a conducting path but then we started putting all these transistors together where uh, we were able to realize very complex functionalities right so now we have uh, microprocessors with billions of transistors so that is what electronic integration is all about in terms of photonic integration uh, we are talking about miniaturizing discrete elements uh, so what you see here is a discrete component on the left side uh, left bottom uh, you see uh, a simple photonic device. This could be uh, a light source and photo detector uh, assembly, or this can be some kind of filter assembly. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to transfer this uh, bulk onto a wafer scale uh, technology, like photonic IC, similar to electronic IC. And then going beyond that, we would like to reduce the size of these devices. so. So that we can more number of device uh, on a chip given footprint and also through this integration you can bring in uh, high value and functionality as well so, so that is the primary focus uh, in photonic integration so what, what do we need uh, to realize this we need uh, multiple uh, components so these are all the components that we need uh, light source coupling uh, uh, waveguides to manipulate light flow in the, uh, in the chip, photo detector to convert photons into electrons, and then uh, light modulator. So this is more uh, the interface between electronic world and the photonic world, and then wavelength selective devices. Right. So how do we discriminate different colors? So th we want all these functionalities. Uh, unlike electronics, where you have single primary component like a, a transistor, here we have multiple uh, functionality, and we want to realize them on chip. So that is the philosophy behind photonic integration. With this, uh, uh, in particular, what do we do in our group? So we develop these photonic devices, as I mentioned. For multiple application, we look at application like high-speed uh, optical communication, uh, optical interconnect application for next gener generation high-performance computing. Uh, so for those application, we built uh, these devices. And if you look at uh, the left uh, uh, bottom, uh, <coughs> the cartoon there shows uh, you know, the schematic of how we would like to connect uh, the microprocessors along with the memory to create a high uh, information highway uh, through photonic integration right so this photonic integration is more like uh, you know the 
optic network that we have uh, all over the globe we want to miniaturize that and put it onto the chip so that uh, your laptops could be as fast as a you know a supercomputer and the other thing that we do is uh, develop material for instance for linear uh, uh, photonic application and also non linear photonic application uh, uh, collaboration here with uh, my colleagues here uh, who, who just spoke, Supradeepa, and also one who will be talking after me. Um, so, uh, uh, so there is an interdisciplinary area there where we are developing material, uh, <clears throat> looking at the application, right? And then the sensor is a is a, a a nice activity where we take this platform and then build build sensors out of it. I will give you an example for. Uh, for high speed uh, interconnect and also for your sensors. Right? So, if you look at the integration, where are we uh, heading? So, if you look at uh, the present scenario, uh, we are generating a lot of data uh, through YouTube that we are, uh, you know. Uh, having this interactive session through, we are putting in a lot of data, and you are also communicating. Uh, uh, so where is this, uh, you know, link coming from? High-speed link coming from? It's uh, it's through the submarine cables and optical fibers that we have, right? So problem exists uh, in in, uh, in uh, uh, microelectronics as well. If you look at uh, you know the 80 core processor or 124 core processor demonstration that Intel did, uh, it is good to have multiple cores. But if they, if you cannot give sufficient data, they won't be able to process them. So this is what we call bandwidth bottleneck, similar to a congested highways that we have in the cities, right? So what is the solution here? The solution already exists. We have optical fibers to solve the, you know, global uh, network problem, and the same problem need to be scaled down. So now we are talking about silicon photonics. So silicon photonics as an enabling technology to uh, address the problem that we have in microprocessors, right? So I'll give you two examples what we can do, right? So as an electronics engineer or a physicist engineer, uh, you might be wondering, uh, how will I fit into this, right? So though we call it as a photonic integrated circuits, it's, it's largely, you know, a device engineering, right? So uh, the cartoon here shows how an electrical data generated can be converted into optical data uh, by using just a PN junction, right? PN diode. So it can be PN or PIN. We all know of uh, operation of these diodes. We exploit this carrier injection and carrier depletion type uh, devices to transfer the data from electrical domain to optical domain. So what you see here is data that's being converted from electrical, uh, you know, 20 gigabits per second to optical 20 gigabits per second by just using this photonic device, right? So this has a potential to, you know, go beyond uh, terabit per second. So this is the technology that we are working on. And uh, if you are going to be working on these kind of really high speed, um, you know, devices for next generation computing and communication. Area that I would like to bring to your uh, you know, uh, notice here is the sensing platform. The same platform could be used for sensing as well. Right? One problem that we normally face in optical sensing is it's very good in uh, selectivity, right? But the sensitivity is pretty low. Optical type sensing like the cantilever or gyros that you use on all your cell phones, they're highly sensitive. So they can sense any kind of vibration, right? So the idea here is to you know, couple this uh, mechanical and optical to build, you know, the super sensor type. So here we are using a cantilever, uh, probably if you uh, have heard of MEMS and in, in, in the next session, uh, tomorrow you might hear about uh, uh, these cantilevers uh, and not, but we are trying to integrate this photonic technique so that you know, the cantilever where some gas molecules can come and sit on this cantilevers and based on the mass or some photos, these molecules absorb certain wavelength, right, that we know from a photothermal effect could be generated and it will change the vibration and this vibration can be sensed, right. And this is what uh, uh, where one can miniaturize this whole mechanical sensing platform onto a chip, right.
So this whole circuit is, you know, probably between 100 by uh, 20 micron, the whole circuitry, right? So that kind of miniaturization could bring, uh, you know, multiple functionalities and array technology and all. You can find more details in my uh, website. And for this year, uh, I'm offering uh, three topics. Uh, plus one, which is in the MA program. Uh, it's a collaboration with uh, one of the colleagues in ECE, uh, Professor Varun Raghunathan. Uh, gallium nitride based photonics, uh, we are looking at uh, the next generation of high speed uh, circuitry, not with silicon, but with uh, gallium nitride. And this will be in collaboration with uh, you know, Professor Digbijay Nath and uh, uh, Professor Vasu. Uh, and then uh, non volatile opti optofluidic uh, integrated switch. This is again an interdisciplinary one if you are. Uh, you know, up to fluidics, and you like photonics. So this will be a very interesting topic to work fluids uh, interacting with photons uh, in a guided wave system. And finally, uh, you know, high performance computing: how we can enhance the speed by using photonics. This can be on-chip interconnect, or this can be, uh, you know, optical PCBs. Uh, for instance, which doesn't exist today, uh, we are trying to develop optical PCBs where we completely get rid of electrical tracks. Uh, that are limiting the speed. Okay, so those are all the topics that I'm offering this uh, year. If you need more details, you can go and check it in my website, and you can also, you know, write to me if you want uh, more details. So we'll move to the next one. So I just start and I'm audible, right? Uh, hello. Uh, primarily, I'm a semiconductor device physicist. Uh, I work with devices, though part of my work also involves growing materials. But my primary focus is on devices. My research area is what you can call category buckets. So I work on. I work on silicon heterojunction solar cells, uh, oxide electronics, and heterogeneous integration on silicon. I'll talk to you, I'll talk briefly about all of these in the following slides. Uh, a lot of questions that are being asked in this uh, session have been based on what, how do you need to prepare? So a few pointers on that. Uh, in during interviews, what I seek is uh, some basic understanding of semiconductor device physics. So you should know band diagrams. You should maybe have some basic idea of device physics. Be able to explain. Uh, Injunctions and triangle ground is not in electronics, and you have not figured out if you have not studied these things in a course. Maybe you can pick up an introductory book and just go through them. So, very, uh, very high importance is the ability to explain your project. Everybody does some sort of BTEC project or master's project, and the ability to explain that project is sort of important. Okay, so what are perovskite solar cells? So, perovskite is basically this new material. Uh, the solar cell looks like something on your screen. It's black in color, which is good because it absorbs a lot of light. Uh, it basically has this ABX3 structure, but these are not details that are terribly important. What is more important is why we are interested in it. Uh, we are interested in it because it is one of the most efficient materials that have been discovered in recent times. Uh, this slide just tries to highlight the fact. So if you look at silicon solar cells, the efficiencies have flatlined and have not changed in the last 15 years. However, in perovskite solar cells, even in the last three, four years, the efficiency have shot up and are very close to where silicon is. And that's very exciting because that means that this material sort of wants to work. Uh, there are some outstanding problems that we still need to be figured out, but it's a material that is very interesting. Uh, my group primarily focuses on two issues. Uh, number one is of scale up. So as researchers, we try to make these very small devices of one or two mm by one or two mm, but 
from a practical standpoint, that's not useful. If you want to deploy this technology, you want to make much larger devices. So that's one of the areas we are focusing on and trying to make these devices that are larger and larger. And that throws up a whole bunch of engineering and also materials challenges. And how do you actually fabricate these devices over large areas? Problem with perovskite is stability. Uh, this is an IV characteristic. If you can't fathom what that is, that is OK. Uh, the point is that it's unstable, that the system is unstable, characteristics change with time. And that's, again, not good for solar cells, because in actual solar cells that are deployed in the field, uh, they have to be guaranteed. They, they need to be guaranteed to work for 30 years. So uh, the stability of a few hours, a few days enough. So those are the two outstanding problems that we are working on. Uh, the other is silicon heterojunction solar cell. Uh, the basic idea is on this slide. Uh, if you look at conventional silicon cells where wafers are heated at 900 degrees C uh, so as to dope them and form a PN junction, and that has consequences because the device structure is complicated, the equipment is expensive. Uh, also, because you're doing heating and cooling, you can't actually work with very thin wafers. The wafers tend to break if you cycle them uh, high heat and low heat. The cost that is relatively higher. The idea is if you can transition to a manufacturing setup, you can use much simpler equipment such as spray coating or spin coating. Uh, thereby, that will enable a much simpler device structure, uh, much thinner wafers, which will save material. So you can make these things much faster and overall lower cost. So that's the basic goal. And to that, we have been working for some time. This is also actually part of, the, uh, of this work I did my PhD and postdoc. So we continue that. Uh, this just slide shows you, for example, that depositing copper oxide on silicon actually improves the device characteristic in, in significant ways. The focus here is on selecting the right oxide, like for a specific reason in this work. Uh, there are other oxides, but you have to select the correct oxide. So what are those selection rules? And B, uh, we have to focus on the interface. So the device is completely decided by the interface between the oxide and silicon or the heterojunction. So engineering it in the correct manner is very important. So that's the focus. Going to the third research topic of oxide electronics. Uh, so oxides are very interesting materials. Uh, they exhibit every known property that is known to physics, uh, GMR, superconductivity, ferroelectricity, plasmonics, piezoelectricity, et cetera. And that is because oxide is a very large class of materials. There are a lot of materials that we can be classified as oxides. Uh, most of the oxides are insulators, but a lot of them are semiconductors. So where are we? Hmm. OK, so this has disappeared. <laughs> but basically, what we are trying to work on is uh, specific so, for example, trying to use oxides for solar cells. This is just uh, some results that we have gotten recently where we are trying to look at some oxides for solar cell applications. Uh, this work is in collaboration with Vaso and Manish. So the all the oxide work actually is part of a big collaboration. So uh, it's a collaboration of four professors. The other part we are looking at oxide electronics is for beyond CMOS type applications. For example, for memory, or uh, is try to see if we can use certain oxide to make non-volatile memories that can compete with flash or SD10. Uh, finally, uh, we also work on some sort of heterogeneous integration. Uh, the idea basically here is that silicon, while it's a great workhorse, uh, it does not have a lot of interesting properties. For example, it does not have piezoelectricity, or it does not have uh, ferroelectricity, or it does not have any magnetic pro magnetic properties. So if you want to get those sort of functional silicon device, then you need to integrate some other interesting materials on top of silicon. And traditionally, this has been a huge challenge. Uh, so that's one of the things I work with Basu, for example. On the left, you see we have integrated germanium on silicon. Interesting material because you can then integrate things like gallium arsenide or anything else. We're also looking at seeing if we can integrate oxide. When I say integrate here, I mean that growing a high enough quality material on top of silicon so that you can make devices on it. So while you can always deposit an arbitrarily quality material on top of silicon easily, but getting a device quality material is much harder a lot of crystal growth and materials uh, research to get that through. So that's, I think that's my last slide. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, please do read our website. Uh, it's actually one of the issues that during the interview, a lot of students don't come prepared after reading a website. It helps the conversation along if you know what I already do, and then we can have a conversation on what you want to do. Okay, this is not working. Oh, this is working. Go. Cool. Do you want to say nothing? Just say, I'm going to 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 say, I'm going to
Okay, um, hi guys, this is uh, Digvijay Nath. I don't have uh, slides, I am the slide in a way. So, uh, actually, uh, uh, and wide band gap materials and devices, uh, primarily working on power electronic devices uh, for next generation power technologies and also uh, deep UV detectors and deep UV LEDs for a lot of strategic and social applications. We're also working on gallium oxide uh, towards the similar kind of application. So, it's a large interdisciplinary group that we have in nitrate and white band gap that goes all the way from this to systems okay so it's a very technologically relevant and uh, you work on so i'm not showing slides because tomorrow on my behalf procedure will be on transferring this gallium nitrate transistors or leds onto uh, a flexible substrate and so on and to characterize them current and flexible electronics and optical electronics so this will involve work on uh, transferring uh, the gallium nitrate substrate and also a lot of electrical and mechanical characterization so uh, background from electronics or mechanical is helpful and Sam tomorrow will show you exactly what you're trying to get so this is only one student shared uh, from my group this time so uh, please uh, feel free questions at my office when you are here. Uh, okay. Good luck.